So for the third reading this day, today, I have chosen one from our Eucharistic prayer of the cosmos because I want to focus on the notion of evolution proceeding through a series of crises and that each crisis is actually an opportunity. So here's the reading from our Eucharistic prayer of the cosmos. Guide the awakener, we honor you. You who patiently call forth more and more complete images of yourself until a species is born that remembers fully. You who send avatars into every age to nudge religion towards spirituality and to move us from mere belief in guides to experiences of the God within and the God among us. You who are the sender of Siddhartha and the commissioner of the Christ. You who continue to send countless others to awaken us from illusion. You who are the gentle mother watching while the great crises of our times are understood for what they really are, great opportunities for seeing beyond the separation into the oneness of isness, our origin, our mission, and our home. We honor you. Words inspired by God. There was a wild colonial boy, Jack Duggan was his name. He was born and raised in Ireland, in a place called Castlemaine. He was his father's only son, his mother's pride and joy. And dearly did his parents love the wild colonial boy. That was the first song I ever learned. I was three years of age, and I was living with my grandparents in a place called Grona Brahar. And I was fascinated. They had a radio, and I was fascinated by the radio. So I'd listen to all these songs, and my grandparents would boast about me. When a neighbor came in, they'd say, wait a minute, and they'd put on the radio, and somebody would be singing. They'd say, Sean, what's the name of that song? And I'd tell them what the name was. And uh, what's the name of the singer? And I'd tell them the name of the singer. So I was really, really happy. I had a great reputation. I knew all the songs and all the singers. And then something happened at age four and it was never the same afterwards. At age four, I came down with some kind of an illness and they never quite figured out what it was. First, they thought it was typhoid. Then they thought it was yellow fever. Then they thought it was cholera. So I spent four months in a hospital, St. Finbar's Hospital in Cork City. And most of that time, I was in total isolation. And it was like a turning point in my life. I came back home after four months, lived with my grandparents again, but something had radically shifted. The kind of the extroverted, music-loving, want-to-sing, boisterous kind of guy. I had turned inside and began to kind of depend mostly on kind of what was happening interiorly. So it was one of maybe five or six major occasions in my life when something that appeared to be a catastrophe, as I look backwards, turned out to be an extraordinary blessing. And I'm certain this happened to every single one of you that retroactively, you look back at some of the great crises of your time when you think things were just falling asunder completely. And you look back now and you realize they were the great blessings. They were your opportunities to involve and evolve really significantly. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to make three main points this morning. And it's an open session. We'll have question and answer discussion afterwards. So the first thing I want to talk about is crisis as an evolutionary opportunity. And then secondly, I want to talk about pain and illness. And then thirdly, I want to talk about prayer and healing. So there are the three points I'll make this morning. So I'm sure most of you are aware that there seems to be a lot of pain and suffering in our world right now. You know, maybe individually you're experiencing some of this, or a family member is we're dealing with an illness of some kind. You know, and certainly you look around at our nation, and we're a nation in turmoil. You look at our world, and certainly the world is in turmoil. So there's a lot of pain and suffering out there right now. And the question becomes, what do we do with that? Are we going to get destroyed by it, lose faith and hope, be filled with anxiety and xenophobia? Or are we going to kind of take this as an opportunity to evolve? So uh, as I look through human history, I look through my own personal history, 
I look at the history of communities. I look even geologically and biologically at the little planet that we inhabit. And I have never seen a significant shift in consciousness which is not precipitated by some kind of a global crisis. Systems do not change radically in the absence of catastrophe. Something really major needs to happen in order to bump us you know, into a ne next stage of being. And I'm just going to give two examples from geology and biology. The first life forms that appeared on planet Earth. The planet is about 4.6 billion years of age. The first life forms emerged about 3.7 billion years of age. And they're just elementary protozoa, single-celled creatures. And they learned to extract hydrogen, which is an extraordinarily plentiful supply all over the known universe. And they learned to, to, to be extract hydrogen from sunlight, feed themselves from sunlight. And they did it from air. They did it from minerals of various kinds, rocks even. And then they discovered that they could extract hydrogen from water. And bingo, they were in, they were in, they were in a cell heaven, because there's an extraordinary supply of water on planet Earth. There was only one problem. When you extract hydrogen from water, you release oxygen. And oxygen was a deadly toxin to the first forms of life on the planet. And so it's like, it was a murder suicide. It was like gorging yourself out in McDonald's you know, and dying of a heart attack on your way out the door. So for 1.5 billion years, life on planet Earth struggled with this dilemma. The more it fed itself, but on the hydrogen that was released from water, the more it poisoned itself with the oxygen that was released. And then over time, nature made this extraordinary creative shift, and it developed a new kind of cell that we call mitochondria. And mitochondria, not only does oxygen not poison it, actually mitochondria feed on oxygen. So there's this extraordinary, it was the first marriage on planet Earth, if you want to use kind of classical kinds of uh, imagery where the cell, kind of the male figure said, I'll give you protection. You can hide inside my interiority. I'll give you a home and I'll protect you if you cook the food for me. And that's exactly what happened. Mitochondria was able to cook oxygen and make food for the cells. So this arrangement still pertains today. In the core of every cell, there's a mitochondria, which takes oxygen in and turns it into energy for the system. So there was a 1.5 billion year long crisis that nature responded to by throwing up a whole new kind of life form. That's how creative nature is. And that's what it does when it's faced with a crisis. In this instance, a global crisis. It looked like all life was going to be wiped out. The second great one, you look at geology. And you look at, at some stages, the planet began to create an excess of calcium, far too much calcium. It wasn't good for the system. So the first response was, let's dump it. It's like our first response, you know, just throw the garbage out the window of the car. So they dumped the excess uh, calcium. And that's known today as coral reefs. The coral reefs were just dumped calcium. They were thrown off the shore of the land masses. There was a second creative response, however, and that was to use the excess calcium as an exoskeleton. Some creatures developed that were able to use the excess calcium and create homes for themselves. There's shellfish of various kinds and crabs of various kinds. So they made uh, mobile domiciles out of this stuff. You know, they surrounded themselves with it. So it gave them protection. There was a third response from nature with this excess calcium, and it was creating endoskeletons. They were able to interiorize this calcium and build skeletal system, the vert vertebrae, which gives them tremendous strength and tremendous mobility. So again and again and again, when nature is faced with some kind of a global crisis, it responds not by giving up, but by coming up with some extraordinary creative response to that. So that's the first point I want to make. No matter what crisis you personally, or you as a family, or us as a nation, or us as a species are facing, and it needs some kind of a creative response. We can't just lie down and let it roll over us. We must come up with some kind of a creative response. That's my first point. The second point I'm going to call pain and illness. And I want to differentiate between, firstly, between pain and suffering. Pain is the privilege and the price of incarnation. Every single one of us signs up. When you sign up for incarnation, you sign up for pain. And it's both the price you pay for being in these spacesuits, and it's the privilege of being in these spacesuits. 
because it is only by experiencing some level of disconnection from source that we can stretch and grow. So pain, uh, you can't avoid pain. Pain is inevitable. But there's a very big difference between pain and suffering. Pain is the price of incarnation and the privilege. You, you agree to come into these spaces which are very, very, very limited in every respect so that you can use the limitation to stretch and develop your spiritual muscle. Suffering is very different. Suffering is optional. Suffering is a result of basically two things, it seems to me. A misidentification of self and believing the wrong stories. Those, those are the two reasons for it. A misidentification with the self. Because of the separation forced on us by our space suits, we think we're separate from everything else. We think we're separate from God, we think we're separate from nature, and we think we're separate from each other. And this is an illusion. Essentially, we're not separate at all. We're different manifestations of the same thing. But we think, we act as if we are completely separated. And we identify with a tiny version of who, who we really are. So I see that there are actually three kinds of self there is what I call the soul self, which is your core essence. It is the part of you that predated incarnation, that survives during incarnation, that survives after incarnation, and survives during reincarnation. It's the part of you which is eternal, that bite-sized piece of God, which was there before, during, and after you adopted a spacesuit. That's who you really, really are. But there are very few people, maybe, apart from the mystics, who understand that, and who operate out of that reality. The second kind of self is what I would call the experiencing self. It's the part of us that engages with the world in which we find ourselves. And so, for instance, we have a sensorium. We drink in data through our five senses. We've got a brain that processes that. We have perceptions. We have willpower. Uh, all of these things are part of what allows us to experience the life. But most of us don't even identify with that. The vast bulk I would say 99.9999% of the experiences we have, you know, we don't really be, they don't belong to us, we think. We, we discard them. So we tend to identify with the third level of self, which is simply the ego. That tiny little story we've told ourselves about who we really are. And a famous Hindu mystic said one time, all human suffering lies in the gap between the ego and the self, between the soul and my sense of who I am. So of all the experiences you have, you're going to sort out a group that somehow align with your self-perception. And any experiences that don't fit into that, you're going to throw out. And so you keep building around a core sense of self, which is predicated just simply on the ego. And the problem is, this doesn't just happen to us as individuals. This happens to us as communities. It happens to us as nations. And it even happens to us as a species. There are three levels to every nation. There is the soul of a nation. Every single nation has a guiding spirit, you know, for which it incarnated, a reason for which it incarnated. But every single nation has an experiencing self. The parts of it actually engage with the world in which it finds itself. But mostly every nation has this egoic sense of self. And any stories that don't align with that sense of self, we discard. We have to create bad guys and good guys, and we're always the good guys, and they're always the bad guys. We even do that as a species. There is a soul to all sentient beings. All sentient life form is an articulation of source of the divine, and it experiences a whole bunch of ways. Birds experience in one way, dragonflies in another way, banana slugs in another way, humans in another way. But they're all garnering experiences to the experiencing self. But at the same time, there is a sense of individuality which separates us from, from each other. And that's the main source of suffering as distinct from pain in our world. And the second great source of suffering is the stories we insist on telling ourselves. And I've suggested to you several times that uh, there are four kinds of stories we tell. The first kinds of stories are our personal stories. The one that you tell when you're sitting beside somebody on an airplane, a stranger, and they say, hi, you know, I'm Maureen, what's your name? Oh, hi, I'm Sean. So where are you from? You know, what do you do? You know, where's that accent from? So I'm going to tell you a story over the next seven or eight hours, you know, which I think is me, a reflective of me. And of course, it's a totally biased sample. It's a completely biased sample. But most of us, uh, the stories we tell about ourselves are these biased samples because that's what we choose to focus on, not what we're experiencing in total, or not the source from which we've come, but the tiny little you know, sensor that's thrown away all the experiences that don't suit our self-image, no matter what the self-image is. 
if I, if I have a self-image as a victim, I'll discard all experiences in which I have actually had control in a situation. If my self-image is that I've been abandoned again and again and again, you know, I'll make sure I destroy all relationships that are supportive of me. If they don't align with my personal story, I'm not going to let them in. And of course, we do the very same thing then in history. History is just the story that the tribe tells itself. And we do the same thing with the tribe. If the stories don't suit our image as a nation or as a tribe, we discard them. We're not really open to our experiencing self as a, as a tribe. We're only really going to factor in the stuff that suits our previous self-image. The third kinds of stories, we tell theological stories. We tell our stories about our special relationship with God. We have a special relationship nobody else has. If we're Jews, we're God's chosen people. If we're Catholics before uh, pre-Vatican II, you know, extra ecclesiam, nulla est salus. Outside the Catholic Church, there's no redemption. If you're a born-again Christian, you think that if you don't accept Jesus as your personal savior, you're out, you're gonna go to hell for all eternity. So we make up these theologies, these gods who are built in our image and likeness. While claiming that we are built in God's image and likeness, we're actually creating God in our own image and likeness. They are the kind of the theological stories we tell ourselves. And the fourth kind of stories are the kind of cosmological stories. We look around the universe and we claim to understand uh, its origin and we refuse to accept ideas that don't mesh with that. So what creates all the suffering, in my experience, is we misidentify our self instead of the source, our experiencing. We just identify with the narrating self. And secondly, we only choose that stories that bolster our previous notions. I would say as a psychologist that 95% of the discord that individual people experience is due to suffering instead of pain. 5% is pain. 5% is the price of, you know, and the kind of the reward in some senses, the challenge of being born into spacers. But 95% is suffering because we're telling ourselves the wrong stories and we're telling it from the wrong perspective. So it becomes really, really important then to understand this distinction between the two of them. Now, so then I want to take the whole notion of illness. And I've run this model before you several times. I believe that illness is a sick factor of the equation. And any illness you experience, whether it's psychological or physiological, will have these six factors built in. They'll be weighted differently. In some instances, some factors will be more important than others. But the six factors are as follows, as far as I can figure it out. I'll name them quick firstly, and then I'll explain a little bit for each of them. The first factor is genetic predisposition. The second one is environmental influence. The third one is personal lifestyle. The fourth one is personal belief systems or cosmology. The fifth one is karma. And the sixth one is the bodhisattva vow. Now let me unpack those for a few minutes. Um, Genetics play a part, obviously, in illness. Now, less and less so. We used to think that you were born with a particular gene set, and therefore you're screwed. You're bound to get cancer or whatever. That's not true. Less than 5% of illnesses are actually uh, genetically predetermined. Less than 5%. So it's what you do with your chromosomes, what you do with your DNA, you know, how you express that, that creates the stuff. So the first one is genetic predisposition. There are obviously, there are racial groups who are more prone to some illnesses rather than to others. Like for instance, uh, Ashkenazi Jews are more likely to get uh, sickle cell anemia than other groups are. And then there's familial stuff. There are some families and it seems like heart attacks run in the family. Uh, so there seems to be some kind of genetic influence, that's the first piece. The second one is environmental influence. And when I say environmental influence, I mean every environment from the utero onwards. The inter intrauterine experience of a little developing fetus or embryo is really important. You know, is the child going to suffer from fetal alcohol syndrome? Is the mo mother doing drugs or, you know, drinking to excess or whatever? Is the mother being adequately fed or is malnourished? Is she being supported by her family or her husband or whatever? Or is she being abused? And so the environment begins even in utero. And then, of course, the child is born into a family. What is the environment that family like? Um, what, you know, foodstuffs are the child uh, given to the child? You know, what kind of an education does it receive? So the environment becomes really important. Are they living in a to toxic place where the air is totally befouled and people are having to wear uh, masks all the time? So environment would be a second factor. Personal lifestyle would be a third factor. Am I a smoker? Am I a heavy drinker? 
Am I sedentary? That I sit in front of the TV with my surfing the channels nonstop? Do I do exercise? Do I get enough sleep? You know, what can this, what's my schedule like? So my own personal lifetime is going to be an, an important factor. Fourthly, personal belief systems. The mind has an extraordinary ability to cure or to cause illnesses of various kinds. We call them sometimes psychosomatic illnesses. Your belief system about, you know, you know why, where you're going to be healthy or not healthy, that's going to be a huge factor. Whether you believe in a world which is going to hell in a handbasket or you're a hopeful person, that's going to determine the level of illness you, you receive and your healing abilities. So that would be number four. Number five is karma. And by karma, I do not mean that we're punished in subsequent lifetimes for sins we've committed in previous lifetimes. I don't believe that at all. Karma for me is the uh, realization that the hand I'm born with was the hand I planned in between lifetimes. It's precisely what I asked for. It's like, I've used this example before. Yeah, a child writes to Santa Claus and says, you know, I'd love a tricycle for Christmas. And he comes on Christmas morning and there's a tricycle under the Christmas tree. He can't believe it. He got exactly what he asked Santa Claus for. Every single one of us, I don't care what your physical condition is, your socioeconomic status was, your race, your color, your class, or your creed, I don't care what it was. You were born precisely into the circumstances that you planned before you came. And that's karma. Karma is the realization that you sign up for stuff in order to learn particular kinds of lessons. And sometimes we'll sign up to experience an illness to see you know, how we can grow through the experience of dealing with an illness. That's the fifth factor. And then sixthly, it's the bodhisattva dimension. Uh, there's a teaching in Buddhism that there are some beings who are really, really, really advanced, like a Buddha figure or a Jesus figure. And they don't need to reincarnate anymore. They've worked off all their karma. There's nothing left to learn that can be, they can learn actually on this planet anymore. They don't need to come back here. But they make a vow to come back for the sake of the rest of us, to wake up the rest of us. Now, I believe there's a little bit of the bodhisattva in every single one of us. To the extent that we can act with empathy or compassion for another human being, that's some of the bodhisattva. So sometimes I think, you know, we accept an illness as part of our incarnational contract in order to, you know, be compassionate to others, I experience within my own body what it is like to have a particular condition, so I can even be more empathetic and more compassionate. So I believe in some senses that uh, all of these six factors are at play in any illness you have. I don't care what it is. And even if you have two separate illnesses, they may be weighted differently. In one instance, there may be more genetics involved. In another instance, there might be more lifestyle involved. In another instance, there may be more karmic. So if, even in the one person, two different illnesses may have a different kind of weighting of the six factors. So what are the outcomes then? If these indeed are the six reasons that we experience illness, what are the outcomes? So I think it becomes really important to differentiate between um, uh, etiology and purpose. When you look at uh, the reasons for being sick in various kinds, there are some reasons which are etiological. You know, for instance, you know, if you're eating a really bad diet, you can very, very quickly figure out, oh, that's the reason I'm you know, diabetic or pre-diabetic right now. So you can figure out the reasons you've got to be in the state you're in. That's the etiology of an illness. That's important. But it is not at all as important as the purpose of the illness. So number one, two, three, and four, have to do with etiology. Genetics, environment, lifestyle, belief systems, they have to do with the reasons that you're experiencing the illnesses you're experiencing. But the next two have to do with the purpose for which you're ill in some way. And they're very different. Not the causes of, but the purpose or the mission of. And so if part of your illness is for karmic reasons or bodhisattva reasons, you know, once you understand that that is the purpose, then you can focus on that, and the illness itself becomes a springboard in your, evolution, your spiritual evolutionary process. So as things go right now, if it's genetics or environment, science will eventually crack it, and they'll figure out ways of doing maybe genetical research or uh, targeted specifically to your particular DNA, rather than just you know, generically responding to a situation with cancer. Our treatment of cancer right now, of like chemotherapy, for me is the equivalent of somebody invades your home and they're holed up in the kitchen. And to get rid of them, you burn down the house. You've gotten rid of the invaders, you've also, you don't have a house left anymore. And so it's barbaric, a lot of the tra medical treatments right now. But eventually we'll get it right. And we'll target specific individuals very specifically with their DNA and the particular illness they're having. So science will get to one and two eventually. 
if it's for three or four lifestyle or belief systems, you have total ability to change the outcome for yourself. If your illness is because of lifestyle or belief system, you're 100% capable of reversing that situation. But if the illness is number five or number six, it's for karmic reasons or bodhisattva, this is your mission and this is what you need to embrace. That will be your springboard to spiritual evolution. The question is how do you determine between them? And as I talk about that later, how do you focus and determine well, you know, what is the purpose of your illness as distinct from merely the cause of your illness? So they're the kind of, they're like the outcomes. That's my second point. So when it comes down then to uh, the third point I want to make is prayer and healing. So suppose your intention is either to try to heal yourself or heal another person. When we talk about prayer as an intervention, what does prayer actually mean? And I suggest that again that there are six components to really good prayer. Whether you're praying for another individual or you're praying for yourself, there are six very important components. And the first one is, it is absolutely useless to pray for healing for myself or for anybody else if I'm, it's coming out of a heart which is filled with anxiety or prejudice of various kinds or particularly unforgiveness against anybody in my life at any stage of my life. It is like trying to give somebody a cup of water from a cup that's filled with bacteria and crap and I scoop out some water and I attempt to give you water. I'm feeding you from a contaminated container. The very first part of really powerful prayer is to examine my own heart and look at, is there anybody in my life with whom I'm still holding a grudge? You know, from age six or age 15 or whatever it is. And this is precisely what Jesus says. He says, if you're going uh, to the temple to offer your gift, and there you realize, I got something against my brother. Leave your gift at the altar. Don't offer it. Go back home, be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come back and offer your gift. He says, in another stage in Mark's Gospel, you can ask the Father for anything in my name, Anything, and I will give it to you. But first, forgive your brother and sister from your heart. They are totally contingent upon each other. You cannot pray effectively for yourself or for anybody else. If you're operating out of a heart which is filled with fear, anxiety, xenophobia, or particularly unforgiveness against anybody, you've got to let go of all that crap in order for it to be defective. That's the first stage of real prayer. The second stage of real prayer then is, I have to fill up my heart with compassion. And compassion is not about where I, Sean, feel empathy for, you know, Chris. It's not about that. It's the realization that Sean and Chris are just manifestations of the same source. We're not separated from each other. We're manifestations from the same source. So all compassion, basically, is self-love. It is God loving herself. And so I know I have to fill my heart up with that realization that whatever intention I'm sending out there is coming out from a place of realization of non-separation. There is no me and you. There is only us as manifestations of one source. And if my heart is filled with that kind of compassion, now I'm ready for stage three of prayer. And stage three is a laserized intentionality. Not I just write down a list, I'm going to pay from Mary and Michael and Johnny and David and whatever, and I scan the list and then that's it. It's trying to hold the target of my prayer with a concentrated awareness and a focus and a concentration. And it doesn't matter how long it lasts. It can be literally just two or three seconds. A focused, laserized prayer of three seconds is much better than in a rosary you know, or a mass offer for somebody where I just, I'm sleep, I'm sleepwalking my way through it. So a laserized intentionality beamed at the target of my prayer, that would be stage three for me. Stage four then is, I have to do whatever is kind of, you know, kind of physically possible or necessary, practical in the situation, to try to ameliorate the situation. There's a great uh, proverb in, in Arabic that says, pray to Allah, but first tie up your camel. Do what you need to do. Don't just depend on God to do everything. You know, another statement in Christian theology says, pray as everything Pray as if everything depended upon God and act as if everything depended upon yourself. So you've got to walk the talk in some way. If there are things you are doing, you know, that are causing the situation, stop doing it. You know, are there, are there things that you could be doing that will help the situation? Start doing it. So the fourth factor is you've got to back up your intentionality with action of some kind. The fifth piece is trust. And trust is not some kind of just a kind of a theoretical faith in some kind of a, a super being. It's this, the relationship that exists between a newborn infant and the mother. Every single child comes in 
and archetypally imprinted on the baby is there's going to be a mother, there's going to be a breast, there's going to be milk. The child is not going to be able to use these words, but the child knows instinctively that's what awaits him. And he comes in, he recognizes it immediately, and he latches onto the nipple. And then the mother feeds him, not just from her breast, but from her heart as well. That that's what uh, trust in God means. The realization that we are archetypally imprinted, you know, with childhood or being children of the mother in source. Right? That total, total understanding that that's how we came. We would not have volunteered to come here if that were not the arrangement. Any more than any child would volunteer for incarnation if there weren't a mother there and somehow to protect it and to feed it. And then the, the sixth, the, so we've trusted in God. The, the sixth one then is to exercise detachment. And this seems counterintuitive. You know, uh, detachment feels like giving up. It's not giving up. It's the realization that the supreme intelligence, God, whatever you want to call it, is infinitely more resourceful than I am or than you are. And that infinite source will determine both the method of the intervention and the timing of the intervention. So when you've done all the other stages, is to detach from the outcome and say, okay, I've done everything you know, expected of me. Now I'm going to let God determine when and if and how it's going to occur. So that becomes really, really important. So if prayer then is effective, and uh, all of you here know prayer is effective. And I know from a scientific viewpoint, because I did, you know, in 1991, 92, and many of you were involved in it, what was then the biggest um, controlled, randomized, double-blind experiment done on prayer with human subjects, 509 people involved. So I know, you know, experientially uh, and ex experimentally that it works. The question then becomes, by what mechanism does prayer work? I mean, do you think that God, you know, temporarily alters the kind of the laws of the universe to indulge the prayers of holy people? I don't believe that at all. So I'm going to run a few models by you. So one model is that prayer of petition, when you're praying for an outcome, is simply chatting about the inevitable. That God already has factored in everything. God is omniscient, and God has factored everything, and so you're wasting your time actually praying. So all you're doing is you're just chatting about the inevitable. God has a plan. God, is, She's going to do it, and you can talk to her if you like, but you're not going to change her mind. So that's one notion. I don't believe that for a moment. The other notion somehow is that God is a kind of a satellite dish in the sky. And so I want to pray for my brother Seamus in Ireland, but because of, the, because of the curvature of the earth, I can't direct a beam at him. So I bounce it off some kind of a satellite in the sky and it redirects it down to Clonakilty in Cork. Now God is some kind of a, a way station in the sky, an orbiting satellite. And I obviously don't believe that's how it works. The third notion somehow is that prayer is a question of bargaining with God in some kind of a Middle Eastern fashion. And so you get great, this great story in the book of Genesis in chapter 18, where God is determined to wipe out the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And um, Abraham's nephew, Lot, is living in one of these cities. So he starts interceding with God. He says, hold on a second. He says, are you going to, suppose there's 50 good people in those cities. You're going to kill all those with the, the bad guys? And God says, whew, gee, didn't think of that. Um, no, I wouldn't do that. I'm God after all. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. And Abraham says, suppose there's five less than 50. Are you going to kill 45 people? But no, no, heaven forbid, I wouldn't kill 45 good people. What about if there's only 40? What about if there's only 30? What about if there's only 20? What about if there's only 10? He gets them all the way down to 10. And God says, that's it, that's my final number. <laughs> if I find 10 good people, I won't destroy the cities. It seems there weren't even 10, because he wiped them out anyway. But there's this notion that you can bargain with God. And if you're really good at it, you get what you want. You know, kind of the Margies of the world. <laughs> Beating up God non stuff. He's afraid of her at this stage. Oh my God, it's Margie Galdas. What does she want? Give it to her quick. Okay. Get, her off my back. Get her off my back. And of course, that's not how Margie works. Mar Margie works because she's one of the most compassionate, loving people I've ever met in my life. And she's pouring out her love. You know, it's the God in Margie that's creating the effect outside. It's not that she's you know, bending God's arm up in the sky someplace and he's giving it to her. So that's a the third model. Fourth model is, you know, that there's some kind of trick. And if you figure out the trick, you can get what you want. So there's a story in Exodus uh, where, I think it's Exodus chapter 17, where the uh, Israelites have just escaped from Egypt and they're in the desert and they come across a tribe, a hostile tribe called the Amalekites. And there's a pitch battle ensues between the Israelites and the Amalekites. And Moses goes up to this little hillock and he goes up the hillock and he says, for God's sake, you took us out of Egypt, you want us to be slaughtered here in the desert, help here, help. And as long as he keeps his hands in the air, the Israelites were winning. But his hands are getting tired and tired and tired and they're drooping. And as his hands fall down, 
the tide turns and the Amalekites are now winning. So two guys see this, Hur and his brother Aaron, and one of them grabs his right hand, Jane, grab his other hand there, and we hold his hands up in the air like this. And now the Israelites have the final victory. Now we think somehow that that's it. There's some kind of a trick, and if we can figure out what it is, God has to give it what we want. Those of us who are raised Catholic, we realize that if you can do the nine first Fridays, which means you've got to go to confession, uh, receive Eucharist, say, and our Father, Hail Mary, glory be to the Father, for the Pope's intentions, and you do that nine months in a row without missing out, you're, you have to get to heaven. God can't keep you out. You can, you, can, uh, you can be a rake for the rest of your life. But when you get to the pearly gates, and Peter says, look, oh, you think you're getting in here? Are you joking me? And you say, check the record, buddy. I did nine first Fridays. And he looks at us, holy God, he's right. All right, come in. So somehow, you do the nine first Fridays, and you get in like Flynn. Or you're a Muslim, if you go to Mecca on pilgrimage even once, you're going to get to heaven. So every group like has a, a trick in getting there. And of course, it's not like that. The best image I can come up with or metaphor I can use is to think that prayer is like a watering system in your home, in your lawn. So you've got an outdoor faucet, you've got a hose pipe you know, on your lawn, you've got flower beds all over the, your lawn. And now you want to water the flower beds. The first thing you have to realize is that, you know, there's also already water in the system. The water is connected up to your tank in the roof or the city system. The water is already there. You know, the grace is already there. You don't have to, you know, in some sense wonder, is it there or is it not there? God is love. God is there constantly. There's this huge tank of love in the sky. It's always available. But now you've got to turn on the faucet. You don't turn off the faucet. Turn on the faucet. No matter how much water is in the tank, you're not going to get anything onto your lawn. So now that's your action. You've got to turn on the faucet. Now, if you have just a hose pipe, a rubberized hose pipe on the ground, and you turn it on over here, what's going to happen? Things could go all over the place like a snake. So now you've got to take control of it. You've got to direct it, grab a hold of it, and you've got to direct it. So that's the laser-raised focused intentionality. And those of you who use old hose pipes in the past, before there were nozzles and stuff, you had to squeeze and put your thumb, and then you could direct the stream. It would go much further. You increase the pressure, it's going to travel further. And then you've got to direct it at the flower bed that you're interested in. So you have to laserize and focus what's happening there. But the water is already there. You simply had to turn it on. And then, so that's prayer pouring out. But the ground, in some senses, also has to cooperate. You put the water down, but there are nutrients in the soil, and they're responding with it as well. So that's how prayer works. There's the kind of the fertility of the target. There's the directionality of the kind of the person who's praying. There's the source of the love there from God. And that's the best way, I think, of, of uh, prayer. It's not that God is changing the rules. It's not that you're bargaining with God. You're not bending how the universe works. You're simply utilizing what's there and what's always been there, but you're using it with intentionality. You're focused. You're directing where it is, and nature is corresponding as well. So that, I think, is how prayer works. Which brings me to the kind of the final section of point three. For me, there's only one occasion when Jesus taught the disciples to pray. He prayed constantly himself. And they complained to him, you know, the Pharisees teach their disciples how to pray. Sadducees teach their people how to pray. How come you never teach us how to pray? We see you praying, but, you know, it seems to be a silent affair. You know, teach us. He said, okay, when you pray, here's what you do. And then he taught the Our Father. And the Our Father, in some senses, is the template of all prayer. And you look at it, the Our Father is divided into two sections. Three statements in the first part and four statements in the second part. And the first three have to do with aligning with God. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the very first part of prayer is aligning with source. It's like I was saying, you know, you get rid of the gunk because God has no gunk and you're filled with compassion because God is filled with compassion. So you align with God. Before you ask for anything, you have to be in alignment with God. And then you can start asking. But you look at the four requests. You know, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Three of those four requests have to do with the fact that we're spirits in spacesuits, and one of them has to do with the fact that we're spirits in spacesuits. In other words, one has to do with our physicality, our incarnational experiences. Give us this day our daily bread. So whatever we, our needs are for incarnation, please supply those needs to us. But the other three have to do with the fact that we're spirits in spacesuit. And so nurturing us spiritually 
through being able to forgive and take us out of temptation or keep us from temptation, they become really important. So it's the ultimate template of prayer. Uh, but firstly, it's in alignment with God. And the final thing I would say, maybe the most powerful one-liner of all time, as far as prayer is concerned, it's where at the Last Supper, you know, uh, Jesus has less than 12 hours of life left. And the apostles are peppering him with questions. They don't realize it's his last night, but they're peppering him with questions. And he's been talking about, you know, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, one of them says, yeah, um, he says, where I'm going, you'll also come. And they said, we don't even know where you're going. And they said, how are we going to get there? We don't even know where you're going, let alone how to get there. And Christ says, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. And then Philip says, you know, you're always talking about the Father. You know, Show us the Father just once. Let's see the Father, and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus goes, oh, you face me. Hey, Philip, have I been with you so long? And you still don't realize that when you see me, you see the Father? The Father is in me, and I'm in the Father just as I'm in you, and you are in me. In other words, real prayer comes from the realization that there is only God. That when you see, you know, uh, Bob Fisher, when I look at Bob Fisher, I'm looking at God expressing herself as Bob Fisher. So the ability to realize that there is only God, the, the namaste, not just that I am God, but that everything that exists is God. That's the ultimate prayer. To be able to say, when you see me, you see the Father. So the question then becomes, how well are we capable of behaving or acting so that it's not as difficult for people to see God when they look at us? So some of us behave in such ways that even though I might believe, you know, that I'm looking at the face of God, it's very hard to recognize it given their behavior or their language or whatever. So the job then becomes to try to transform the ego self into the experiencing self, into the soul self, so that it becomes obvious to others, you know, that you are, when they look at you, they're looking at the Father. Okay. Let's open it up, guys. Evelyn. I'd like to ask about the karma. I mean, before you come to this world, yeah. you sign something. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Let's put it that way. Yes. So you, you're supposed to feel full. Do you know? Yes. Well, what you have signed for. Exactly. Now, my problem is what happened to the individual who is, who, who is in this world and does only bad? He kills, he, I mean, right. anything. What did right. he sign? Right. Right. What did he sign before? <laughs> the same one that you've signed. That's a great question. Let me respond to it. So Evelyn's making the point, uh, is karma some kind of a, a contract that you sign before you come down? And so how do you account for people you know, who are murderers or killers of various kinds? You know? Did they sign a dog and be killers? Absolutely not. So I believe, Evelyn, that we make these, I call it preconception contracts, that groups of souls migrate from lifetime to lifetime with each other. They change roles, they change genders, they change socioeconomic status. It's like they're putting on a different drama each lifetime they come in order to develop their acting skills, by which I mean they're developing their ability to love. But uh, there's no script and there's no plot. I had a, a client one time who was a professional actor, and he told me, he said, there are, you know, an improv theater is two people get on stage and uh, there's no script, there's no plot. Somebody from the audience says, uh, you know, Honolulu. And they have to make up a plot about Honolulu. So one person is going to say something, the other guy is going to respond and have to try to create a drama from a word that was just thrown at them. And he told me there were two rules to improv. The two rules are you can't refuse to work with any line that your partner gives you. Whatever they throw at you, you have to work with. You've got to work with that. Otherwise, the whole thing's going to fall. And the second thing is, my job is to feed you a line that's going to make you look good. If I feed you a line that makes me look good, but makes a fool of you, the whole thing is going to collapse. So my job is to feed you lines that make you look good, and your job is to feed me lines that make me look good. So we come down here. We don't have a plot. We don't have a script. We only know two things. We know the previous track record of every one of the people we're coming in with. We have access completely to their FBI files. We know exactly how they've behaved in previous lifetimes. So we know what their kind of possibilities are, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. And we know, secondly, what our mission is. Each one of us knows precisely what I'm coming down here to do. And we land here and we realize we have free will. 
We can do anything we want, but we contracted it to X, and we know the characters we're coming in with, and now we're going to take our chances. So people come down, and they just tear up the script because they're not even aware there is a script or a contract, I mean. They're not even aware that there is a contract. It's, we're given free will that's supposed to morph into freedom. There's a huge difference between free will and freedom. Free will is the ability to do as I please. Freedom is the ability to do as pleases God. And we're supposed to morph from free will to freedom, that we make only choices for love. We're here to move from narcissism to compassion, and we're here to, to move from kind of uh, self-engrossment to self-realization. That's what we're all here to do. But we have total free will to screw it up any way we want. So most people are not even aware that they signed a contract. And even if they signed a contract, if life gets tough and they say, you know what, yeah, I, I didn't realize what I was letting myself in for, I don't think I can keep the terms, you know, I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. Tom. So, um, Sean, at the end here, when you talked about prayer, and number six was exercise detachment. Yes. And then you concluded your homily with, you know, that we recognize the God within us and the God within you. Right. So expand a little bit on how you detach from that. Okay. okay. So when I talk about detachment, most of us think that when we pray for an outcome, uh, that we want it to happen precisely when we want it to happen and in the precise fashion in which we want it to happen. Not realizing that, you know, we're in dialogue with the level of ourselves, the transcendent, you know, ineffable source, which is much more powerful than this little particular uh, in, in articulation of it. And so it becomes really important to let the expert decide, you know, how to deal with the request, rather than me voicing saying, I want it on Tuesday at 3.30, you know, and I want it to happen this way. I've used this example for you before. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Ireland in the uh, 1950s, the government had initiated a scheme called the Rural Electrification Scheme, where they were trying to bring electricity to all the outlying villages. And I had an uncle who lived in a very remote part of Ireland called Connemara. He was totally self-sufficient. He lived with his mother. And I called her Aunt Mag, although she was my grand-aunt. And they had their own cattle. You know, they, made their, they churned their own butter. They had their own milk. Grew their own potatoes, their own vegetables. They had their own meat. Totally self-sufficient. And the only source of light they had was candles. They'd light candles in the evening. And now this electrification scheme is coming across and they're running these poles and these wires. So I go up there for my summer holidays, you know, and I was about like 12 or 13, and uh, I go into the house and there's a single bulb naked hanging right down the middle. There was only two rooms. You know, there was the main room and then there was the bedroom. That was pretty much it. Hanging down. And I said to her, Anne Egg, how do you like the electricity? And she says, oh, it is grand entirely. I do turn it on in the evening when I'm looking for the matches to light the candle. <laughs> and that's exactly what she did. When it got evening time, she turned on the light, ferreted the bone, where did I put my matches, got them, struck it, lit the candle, and knocked this thing out, because that thing costs money. So it's like, we're have, we have electricity in the house, and we're depending on candles. So the attachment is the realization, why would I depend on candle lights, you know, when I have, you know, all these kinds of fancy electrical devices available to me. So that's what I mean by detachment. I want a particular outcome, but I'm not going to insist that it happen in my time or in my fashion. Yeah. Ingrid. Uh, thank you. This is such a synchronicity because yesterday I was out and about and I took a fall, which totally disrupted my plans for the day. So I went home, I put my ice pack on, I took some Advil and I started to watch some Gaia TV and I turned on Regina uh, um, Meredith and she was interviewing this guy named Bill McKenna, and he was talking about the only lesson. And he was your typical type A dude, rich, um, male alpha type, and he ruined his yacht, and he was out of commission with it. It just set him back, and he was, so what's happening? And he wanted to learn about more intuition to understand what the meaning of this was. And he started to um, read a lot of Eckhart Tolle and David Hawkins. And he went to this one teaching, and they said, yes, you have to uh, do forgiveness work to be an open channel, open up the heart and open up the mind. So this guy was doing healings, just energetic healings, and this one woman who came up to the stage had fibromyalgia. So he looked, he had a glass of water, he put this thought form, this prayer, this blessing, in the glass of water, and he had her drink it. He asked her to get up, her mobility was immediately improved, she was walking around, she was, her pain level dropped down, 
And um, Bill was watching this, saying, how does this, how can this be? He checked with the woman a few weeks ago. She maintained her healing. He asked the teacher what he did, and he said, I pictured her whole, perfect, happy, in bliss. I didn't have any expectation. I didn't even really tell her that. But because he had that visual, that image of her complete happiness, well-being, blissfulness, somehow she matched that. And that's all he does now, is he goes around, holds group healings, and says, where's your pain level? And then he just pictures you perfectly happy and well. Mm. That's beautiful, Ingrid, beautiful. So, so can you just kind of add to that a little bit? Uh, my hit then would be that, uh, of the f six factors that cause illness, if it's of number one, two, three, or four, then it is absolutely possible to completely reverse it. If how my mission is to kind of experience this for whatever reason or for whatever duration, in that instance, it may well have been that her fibromyalgia was meant to be experienced so that she would come across a healer which would that would teach her, you know, how to uh, pray in some fashion. So, and that the purpose of the illness was to encounter that. Sometimes the purpose of an illness it will see us right through to the end of our lives. We were not certain. Now, I'm convinced that what faith really does, it really uh, builds upon nature's proclivity for making several choices simultaneously. I'm totally convinced that when nature is faced with a choice between A and B, significant choices, I'm not saying like, well, I have a Coke or a Fanta, I'm not talking about that. If there is um, a significant choice to be made, nature chooses between A and B, nature chooses both, A and B. And having chosen A, if there's a choice between C and D, it'll choose both. Or having chosen B, if there's a choice between E and F, it'll choose both. So in other words, nature spins off constantly parallel universes in which you're acting out you know, the results of previous significant choices you've made. And so in one universe, this woman of yours is experiencing fibromyalgia, and if she hadn't encountered this person or learned this, she would continue, her, that would be her trajectory. Now there's a decision point, and she spins off a universe in which she's fully healed, and she's acting, you know, she's following that piece through. So we spin off literally, you know, parallel universes by the significant choices we make, including health choices and mission choices. Yeah, all right. If I understood you correctly, the person that has to be healed has to be willing and able to receive that too. It can't just be the bombardment of the person that's trying to heal you. You have to have something, the person that is being, am I correct? Yeah, absolutely, so you're asking a great question. Uh, can prayer be effective if the recipient is not open to it? Mm -hmm. um, I would say personally that maybe uh, a prayer is 100% is effective if both the recipient and the sender you know, are operating in alignment or out of love. But even if the recipient is not open to it, you know, sometimes there is an effect. Uh, precisely because we're basically, we're energetic beings. When Einstein created his famous formula, e is, equal to e, e is equal to mc squared, E stands for energy, M stands for mass, and C stands for the speed of light. And so we realize that, you know, basically when you reduce everything down to its subatomic levels and down beyond that, you're left with energy. So everything that exists is, this is an energy form. It seems to be solid, but it's an energy form. You are an energy form. Every organ in your body has its own, you know, um, periodicity or its own, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, rate of, uh, give me a word here for it. Vi frequency, thank you, thank you. Has its own frequency. Your heart has a frequency, your liver has a frequency, your brain has a frequency. All these things are vibrating. They're sending literally waves of energy out into the universe. So these are going to interact with other people. So if I pray for Manny, and Manny doesn't want me praying for him, my energy is still interacting with his energy. There's going to be some kind of an effect from the fact that there's two energies meeting. The energy of kind of sending something that I want and him kind of rebutting what he doesn't want. So even in that instance, there is some effect created there. Now if he's you know, like a, a satellite dish, so all the energy I sent him, he bounces, no matter where it hits, he bounces right into the center, it's going to be more effective. So it's not quite 100% accurate to say that the recipient has to be open in order for there to be any effect. There can be an effect without that. It's a lessened effect. Now the question I ask is, do I have a right to pray for an outcome for somebody without their permission? And personally, I don't. I don't think I have that right. You know, I think, for instance, I'm a fundamentalist Christian, and I want everybody to believe in the Lord Jesus. So I'm going to pray for everybody, you know, to come around to get baptized in the Lord. I don't believe I have that right to force this on somebody. So I love Ingrid keeps reminding us of this statement, the most benevolent outcome 
or Jesus would have said, thy will be done. So when we pray for any target, you have to say, thy God's will be done. Whatever the most benevolent outcome is, I'm not going to force my version of what that is on the other person. I want to be a conduit for a love, loving experience, but I'm not going to force an outcome on anybody, particularly uh, without their permission, you know, or if, if I know that, uh, you know, I'm going to pray for a Muslim so that he becomes a Christian. That's totally verboten, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So it's 11 o'clock, guys. Uh, Chris, we'll end with Chris. Yeah, uh, just a couple of comments uh, concerning forgiveness and compassion. Um, kind of a dilemma on forgiveness because you, you know you hear this all your life. You know how good it is to forgive, but uh, kind of makes me wonder why is forgiveness better than revenge when revenge <laughs> makes you feel so much better. <laughs> I tell you one thing, Chris. It takes a lot longer than revenge. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. And the other thing on compassion. Um, Let's say, hypothetically, I, I had this totally wonderful friend, and he just believed in wonderful things. He believed in, like, tax cuts for the poor. He believed in more food stamps so children would get enough to eat in this country. It's, it's unbelievable that one in five goes to bed hungry every night. Um, and he was just totally kind and compassionate. But then... Um, Suppose he got a blow to the head, and then all that changed and became uh, very negative and a real problem. And I like to think that I would do everything I could in a compassionate way to help him get back to his normal self. Um, but my question is, like, sort of <laughs> in my own mind, how would you handle it if? He got a blow to the head that was so severe that, like, he became a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> I would take you out of that stage. <laughs> so two great questions. The first one, the importance of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not about condoning anybody's, you know, bad behavior. It's not about that whatsoever. Forgiveness actually is an act of self-love for two reasons. The first reason is that if I am holding unforgiveness in my heart, I'm the guy who's suffering. Very, very often, the person I'm really annoyed or angry with is totally unaware of the fact that I hold these kind of uh, um, feelings towards them. So the person who's suffering when I'm unforgiving is me. So the first reason I need to get, get rid of uh, unforgiveness is that I'm the guy you know, who's carrying the, the bag of stones in my back. And the second is, there is only me. There's only one of us. There's only one human being on planet Earth. Just I've used this example before, you know, uh, you, Chris, with 70 trillion cells in your body, were the result of a single cell, a zygote, when a sperm met an egg, and you came into being, and it, it uh, divided into two, four, eight, sixteen, etc. Uh, every single one of those cells contains the information to reconstruct you. Now, I think the same thing is true of all seven and a half billion of us on planet Earth. There's only one of us here. You could take the DNA from any one human being, and I don't mean our chromosomal makeup, I mean the spirit of God inside in us. And you could recreate the entire human experiment from any one of us if you, if you could grok and harvest the spirit inside. So there's any one of us. So you may as well, um, your mouth may as well be angry against your toe for stubbing it against the stool as to be angry against somebody else. There's only one organism. So for one part of the organism to be upset with the other part of the organism and refuse to say, no, it's your fault, you know, you, you walk me into it. It's totally meaningless. So forgiveness is uh, a gift to the self as well as to the other. The other question then about, you know, somebody who gets a blow over the head and their personality changes. You have to realize that, you know, the physical brain is merely a television set. If you and I are watching a television set, let's say, you know, the uh, 49ers are playing, you know, and the uh, television set breaks down, I said, well, we thump it a few times, you know, and it goes squiggly lines. You know, we can hear a, a, an auditory commentary, and then it goes on as well, and we keep bound, beating it. None of us thinks that the ball game has ground to a halt. Where, where do they play now? Is that San, San Jose or Santa Clara? Where's the 49ers playing? Santa Clara. None of us believes that the, the ball game has grown to a halt in Santa Clara because the, our television set isn't working. The television set is not creating the ball game. The television set is merely an antenna uh, that's transducing electromagnetic signals into an audio and visual format. The television breaks down, the game hasn't ground to a halt. 
And so the same way you damage somebody's brain, you've affected the soul's ability to articulate itself through this particular organism. But you haven't affected the soul. And so in some senses, you have to realize that this is just a spare suit. And if you do particular kinds of damage to this spare suit, it'll behave or misbehave according to its now reduced capacities. But the soul is not confined to what the spare suit is capable of doing.